welcome to my home. We are aboard the ferry boat Vallejo, which is tied up at the north end of Sausalito, close to San Francisco, and this is where I live. And you may think this place is rather weird, but that's because I've always loved weird things. I remember when I was a little boy, people used to say to me, Alan, you're so weird. Why can't you be like other people? Well, I thought that was just plain dull, like having the same thing for dinner every day. And as is well said, variety is the spice of life. So you will indeed find this place uh, rather strange. And some of the things that are weird are weird because they are just obvious and nobody ever thinks of them. Some of the most fascinating scientific discoveries have been made by people who called ordinary common sense in question. Like anybody can see that the earth is flat and people know it's flat. And calling that fundamental assumption in question is really the beginning of geography. And when I think over the weirdest of all things I can think of, you know what it is? Nothing. The whole idea of nothing is something that has bugged people for centuries, especially in the West. Because we have a saying in Latin, ex nihilo nihil fit, which means that out of nothing comes nothing. You can't, in other words, get something out of nothing. And it's occurred to me that this is a fallacy of tremendous proportions that lies at the root of all our common sense, not only in the West, but in many parts of the East as well. And it comes up as a kind of terror of nothing, a put down on nothing, on everything to do with nothing, everything associated with nothing, such as sleep, passivity, rest, and even the feminine principle is often equated with the negative principle. Although women's lib people don't like that kind of thing, but when they get through understanding what I'm going to tell you, I don't think they'll object. Because what has struck me is that nothing, the negative, the empty, is exceedingly powerful. I would say, not ex nihilo nihil fit, out of nothing comes nothing, but I would say you can't have something without nothing. For how do we basically begin to think about the difference between something and nothing? I can say, there is a cigar in my right hand and there is no cigar in my left hand. And so we get the idea of is here and isn't or empty here. But behind that, of course, lies the far more obvious contrast of solid and space. Now, we tend to think of space as nothing. When we talk about the conquest of space, there's a little element notice of hostility in that phrase. But actually, we're talking about the conquest of distance. Space as such, that is to say, whatever it is that lies between the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and the Sun, is considered, especially since the Michelson-Morley experiment, which proved there was no ether, is considered to be just nothing at all. But to suggest how very powerful and important this nothing at all is, let me point out to you that if you didn't have space, you couldn't have anything solid. To begin with, without space outside the solid, you wouldn't know where the solid's edges were. For example, you can see me on the camera because you see a background here and all around me, and that background shows up my outline. But if that wasn't there, then you would notice, say, only the beads and the microphone here, and this would become the background. But you always have to have a background to see a figure. You just can't do without it. So that means that the figure and the ground, the solid and the space, 
in some way are inseparable and go together. Now, we find this very commonly in the phenomena of magnetism and electricity. A magnet has a north pole and a south pole, and a battery has a positive pole and a negative pole. There is no such thing as a magnet with one pole only. That's supposing we equate with north with south and north with is and south with isn't then we see we can't do without the two of them. You can chop the magnet in two, supposing it's a bar magnet, and you'll just get another north pole and south pole on the end of each piece. And so in the same way, a current will not flow through an electric circuit until the negative pole is connected as well as the positive. Because the current does not wait in the wire like water in a hose and then begin to flow when you, as it were, connect it with the negative pole like turning on the nozzle. There won't be any current in the wire at all until its end point, which is the negative, is established. So what this is trying to get into our basic logic is this, that there isn't a sort of fight between something and nothing. You know the famous words of Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question. It isn't. To be or not to be is not the question. Because, as I think I've shown, you can't have a solid without space. And therefore, you can't have an is without an isn't, a something without a nothing, a figure without a background. And we can turn that right the other way round and say you can't have space without solid. Because Imagine nothing but space. Space, 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 with nothing in it at all forever. But there you are imagining it, and you're something in it. To have the whole idea of there being only space, and nothing else at all, is not only inconceivable, but perfectly meaningless. Because we always know what we mean by contrasts. We know what we mean by white in comparison with black. We know life in comparison with death. We know pleasure in comparison with pain, up in comparison with down. But you will notice of all these things that they must come into being together. You don't have first something, then nothing, or first nothing, and then something. Something and nothing are two sides of the same coin. And as you know, if you take a coin, and you file away the tail side of it, and you file that side of it away completely, the head side will disappear as well. So, in this sense, the positive and the negative, the something and the nothing, are inseparable, they go together, and in this way you could say that the nothing is the force whereby the something can be manifested. Without space, we couldn't see the stars. The stars not only occupy space, but have space between uh, one point of the sphere and the opposite point. So the space everywhere is absolutely basic to there being anything at all. Now ordinarily we think that what is basic to the physical world is something we call matter. And then matter has various shapes. We think of tables as made of wood. We think of pots as made of clay. But I ask you, is a tree made of wood in the same way as a table is? No, that would be stupid, isn't it? Because a tree is wood. It isn't made of wood. Wood and tree are two different names for the same thing. But there's in the back of our mind the notion, as a root of common sense, that everything in the world is made of something, made of some kind of basic stuff. And physicists, through the centuries, have of course wanted to know what that was. And physics began as a quest to discover the basic stuff out of which the world is made. And with all our advances in physics, we've never found it. What we have found is not stuff, but form. We have found shapes. 
we have found structures. Because when you turn up the microscope and you look at things where you thought there was some sort of stuff, you find instead form, pattern, structure. You find the shapes of crystals and you go in beyond the shapes of crystals and you find molecules. And you go in beyond molecules and you find atoms and you go in beyond atoms and you find electrons and positrons between which there are vast spaces and we can't make up our minds as to these electrons whether they're waves or whether they're particles and so we call them wavicles but they're very tiny and if you want to ask what stuff are electrons made of we might be able to make a further analysis but what we will come up with will never be stuff it will always be a pattern a moving pattern which can be described and measured but we never get to any stuff for the simple reason that there isn't any. You see, what stuff is, actually, is when you see something unclearly or out of focus, it becomes fuzzy. You know, we say stuffing in something like kapok in a cushion or stuff like clay because when we look at it with the naked eye, it looks just like goo. We can't make out any significant shape to it. But then when you put it under the microscope, you suddenly see shapes. It comes into clear focus as shape. And you can go on and on and on, looking into the nature of the world, and you will never find anything except form. Because think of stuff. Why, you wouldn't know how to talk about it, even if you found it. How would you describe what it was like? You couldn't say anything about a structure in it. You couldn't say anything about a pattern or a process in it because it'd be just absolute primordial goo. Well, what else is there besides form in the world? Obviously, between the shape, the significant shapes of any form, there is space. And space and form, in that sense, go together as the fundamental things we're dealing with in this universe. And that's why there's a Buddhist saying, really, the whole of Buddhism is based on this saying, which is, that which is void is precisely form, and that which is form is precisely void. And let me illustrate this to you in an extremely simple way. When you use the word clarity, what do you mean by clarity? What's the first thing you think of when I say clarity? Well, it might be a perfectly polished lens or mirror or a clear day when there's no smog and the air is perfectly transparent like space. Now, what's the next thing you think of? clarity. The next thing you think of is form in clear focus. All the details articulate and perfect. So the one word clarity suggests to you these two apparently completely opposite things. The clarity of the lens or the mirror and the clarity of articulate form. And it is in this sense, then, you see, that the Buddhists say, form is void, void is form. Or we could put it in another way. Instead of saying is, we could say implies. Or the word that I invented, goes with, spelled all in one. Like a front goes with a back. A male goes with a female. And so on. So form always goes with void. And there really isn't in this whole universe any stuff. Form, indeed, is inseparable from the idea of energy. And frisky form, especially when it's moving in a very circumscribed area, appears to us as solid. In the same way, for example, when you spin an electric fan, the empty spaces between the blades sort of disappear into a blur, and you can't push a pencil, much less your finger, through the fan. So in the same way, you can't push your finger through the floor because the floor's going too fast. But basically, 
what you have down there is nothing except nothing and form in motion. I know there was a physicist at the University of Chicago, he was rather crazy like some scientists, and <laughs> this impressed him so much, the ins insolidity, the instability of the physical world, that he used to go around in enormous padded slippers, you know, for fear he should fall through the floor. But here it is, this common sense notion that the world is made of some kind of stuff is shown to be a, a nonsense idea in the back of our minds. It isn't there at all. But instead, form and emptiness. Now we all know that energy is always vibration, pulsation. Whether it be the energy of light or the energy of sound, it's always on and off. And in the case of light, say you get very fast light, very strong light, uh, even say with alternating current, you don't notice the discontinuity because your retina retains the impression of the on pulse. And so that carries over during the off pulse and you don't notice the off pulse except in a slow light like an arc lamp. And it's exactly the same thing with sound. When you hear a high note that goes it seems much more continuous. That's because the vibrations are faster than a low note as when I go Now, in that, you can hear a kind of graininess. And that graininess is because you are hearing the rapid alternations of on and off on a lower note. So that all wave motion, then, is this process. And it's curious, isn't it, when we think of waves and talk about waves, we think about the crests. We think about this point, and we say, that is waves. And that is because the crests stand out from the underlying uniform bed of water, which is relatively solid in comparison with the space above, so that these crests are perceived as the things, the forms, the waves. But isn't it obvious that you cannot have the ups without the downs. You could call, you see, you get this dividing line here between above and below. Now, isn't it obvious, first of all, you cannot have the emphasis called a crest, the concave, without the de-emphasis or convex called the trough. They necessarily go with one another so as to have anything standing out, there must be, as it were, something standing down or standing back. So in this way, we must realize that if you had this part alone, the up part, that would not excite your senses in any way because there would be no contrast. In other words, when sound comes upon your ear, the eardrum vibrates. When the on pulse of the sound comes, the eardrum is driven in a little. When the off succeeds, the eardrum comes out again. And so the eardrum wiggles. If you just pushed it in uniformly and left it there, you wouldn't hear anything. In the same way, if there is no sound and the eardrum is not being pushed at all, you have silence. But to have sound, you must have the alternation of sound, silence, sound, silence, sound, silence. And so you get that which you can hear on a very deep note. Now the same thing is true of all life together. We shouldn't really contrast existence with non-existence because actually existence 
is the alternation of to be and not to be, of positive and negative, of on and off. So you could say existence is eternal if we are to consider existence as this alternation of now you see it, now you don't, now you see it, now you don't, now you see it, now you don't. It is that contrast that presents the sensation of there being anything at all. Now, in light and sound, these waves are extraordinarily rapid so that we don't hear the interval between them. But there are other circumstances in which the waves are extraordinarily slow, as in the alternation of day and night, light and darkness, and the much vaster alternations of life and death, of the great slow cycles of the world. But these alternations are just as necessary to the being of the universe as in the very fast motions where we get it in light and in sound and in the sense of solid contact, where it's going so rapidly that we notice the continuity or the is side and we ignore the intervention of the isn't side. But it's there just the same, just as there are vast spaces within the very heart of the atom. Now, another thing that goes along with all this is that it's perfectly obvious that the universe is a system which is aware of itself. In other words, we as living organisms are forms of the energy of the universe just as much as the stars and the galaxies. And through our sense organs, this system of energy becomes aware of itself. But there's a puzzle in this, which again relates back to our basic contrast between on and off and something and nothing, which is this, that the aspect of the universe which is aware of itself, that is to say the aspect which, to put it in a very clumsy phrase, does the awaring, does not see itself. In other words, you can't look at your eyes with your eyes. You can't kiss your own lips. You can't bite your own teeth. You can't observe yourself in the act of observing. All scientists, neurologists, physicists have wanted to do that, but they can't do it. Just as you can't touch the tip of this finger with the tip of this finger no matter how hard you try. And that therefore creates on the backside of all observation a blank spot. Just for example, as behind your eyes, from the point of view of your eyes, however you look around, there is, is blankness behind them. That's the unknown. That's the part of the universe, in other words, which does not see itself because it is seeing. And so we always get this division of experience into one half known, one half unknown. We would like, of course, it would be fascinating if we could know the always unknown. But if we say, examine the brain and the structure of the nerves behind the eyes, we're always looking at somebody else's brain out there. We're never looking at our own brain at the same time as we're investigating somebody else's brain. So there always remains this blank side of experience. Now what I'm suggesting to you is this, that the blank side of experience has the same relationship to the conscious side as the off principle of vibration has to the on principle. Do you see that? There's a fundamental division. The Chinese call them the positive side, the yang, and the negative side, the yin. That corresponds to the idea of one in our uh, language and zero. All numbers can be made of one and zero. That's the called binary arithmetic, which is used for computers. And so it's all made up of off and on, and therefore equally of conscious and unconscious. But the unconscious 
is, so to say, the part of experience which is doing consciousness. Just as the trough manifests the wave, the space manifests the solid, the background manifests the figure. And so all that side of life which you call unconscious, unknown, impenetrable, is unconscious and is unknown and is impenetrable because it's really you. In other words, the deepest you is the nothing side, is the side which you don't know. So in this sense, don't be afraid of nothing. I could make a joke and say there's nothing in nothing to be afraid of. But people in our culture are terrified of nothing. They are terrified of death. They are uneasy about sleep because they think it's a waste of time. And they have a lurking fear in the back of their minds that all this universe is eventually going to run down and end in nothing. And it will all be forgotten, buried and dead. But this is a completely unreasonable fear because it is just precisely this nothing which is always the source of something. Think of it once again in the image of clarity. We say crystal clear. Nothing is what brings something into focus. And this nothingness symbolized by the crystal is your own eyeball, your own consciousness, and the clear space in which all the stars have freedom to be seen. As far back as I can remember, into earliest childhood, I've always been absolutely fascinated with the idea of death. Now, you may think that's kind of morbid, but you know when a child at night says the phrase, if I should die before I wake, there's something about it that's absolutely weird. What would it be like to go to sleep and never wake up? Now, most reasonable people just dismiss the thought. They say, you can't imagine that. They shrug their shoulders and say, well, that'll be that. But I suppose I'm one of those ornery people who aren't content with an answer like that. Not that I'm trying to find something else beyond that, but that I'm just absolutely fascinated with what it would be like to go to sleep and never wake up. I mean, uh, lots of people think it would be like going into the dark forever or being buried alive. But obviously, it wouldn't be like that at all. Because we know darkness by contrast and only by contrast with light. I have a friend, a girl, who's very intelligent and articulate. And she was born blind. And she hasn't the faintest idea what darkness is. The word means as little to her as the word light. So if you went to sleep, you're not aware of darkness when you're asleep. And so if you went into sleep, into unconsciousness, for always and always and always, it wouldn't be at all like going into the dark. It wouldn't be at all like being buried alive. It would be as if as a matter of fact, you had never existed at all. Not only you, but everything else as well. You would be in that state as if you had never been. And there, of course, there would be no problems. There would be no one to regret the loss of anything. You couldn't even call it a tragedy because there would be no one to experience it as a tragedy. It would be simple, nothing at all. Forever and for never, 
because not only would you have no future, you would also have no past and no present. Now you would think that that was the point where we'd say, well, let's talk about something else. But I'm not content with that, I demur. Because this makes me think of two other things. This state of nothingness makes me think, first of all, the, the only thing I, I get anywhere in my experience that's close to nothingness is the way my head looks to my eyes. Because I seem to feel that there is a world out there as it were, confronting my eyes. And then behind my eyes, there isn't a black spot. There isn't even a hazy spot. There's nothing at all. I'm not aware of my head, as it were, as a black hole in the middle of all this luminous visual experience. It doesn't even have very clear edges because the field of vision is an oval. And if I run my fingers along my field of vision, it's like this. And this is the point where my fingers just disappear from sight, vague edged. But then behind this oval of vision, there is nothing at all, just from the sense of sight. Of course, if I use my fingers and touch, I can feel something behind my eyes. But if I use the sense of sight alone, there's just nothing there at all. Now, nevertheless, out of that blankness, I see. Well, that's the first thing it makes me think of. Now, the next thing it makes me think of is this. If when I'm dead, I am as if I never had been, then that's the way I was before I was born. Because just as if I try to go back behind my eyes and find what is there, I come to a blank. If I try to remember back and back and back and back, I've got my earliest memories. And then behind them, nothing. Total blank. But just as I know there's something behind my eyes by using my fingers on my head, so I know through other sources of information that before I was born, there was something going on. There were my father and my mother and their fathers and mothers and the whole material environment of the earth and its life out of which they came and behind that the solar system and behind that the galaxy and behind that all the galaxies and behind that another blank space. So I reason that if I go back when I'm dead to the state where I was before I was born, couldn't I happen again? You know, what has happened once can very well happen again. If it happened once, it's extraordinary. And it's not really very much more extraordinary if it happened all over again. So in other words, I do know for certain because I've seen people die and I've seen people born after them that at any rate, after I die, not only somebody but myriads of other beings will be born. That I know. We all know that. There's no doubt about it. But what worries us is that when we're dead, there could be nothing at all forever, as if that was something to worry about. Before you were born, there was this same nothing at all forever, and yet you happened. And if you happen once, you can happen again. Now, what does that mean? Well, we'll get at it first in its very simplest way, 
and to explain myself I must invent a new verb. This is the verb to I. And in the first place we'll spell that with the letter I. But instead of having it as a pronoun, we'll call it a verb. The universe eyes. It has eyed in me and it eyes in you. Now let's re-spell the word E-Y-E. -E. When I talk about to eye something, it means to look at something, to be aware of something. So we'll change the spelling and we'll say the universe eyes. It becomes aware of itself in each one of us. And it keeps on eyeing. And every time it eyes, every one of us in whom it eyes feels that he is the center of the whole thing. And that I know that you feel that you are I in just the same way that I feel that I am I. And we all have the same background of nothing. We don't remember having done it before. And yet it has been done before, again and again and again, not only before in time, but all around us everywhere else in space is everybody is the universe eyeing. Now look, let me try and make this clearer in this way when I say it's the universe eyeing. Who is eyeing? What do you mean by I? Well, there are two things you can mean by it. On the one hand, you can mean what's called your ego, your personality. But that's not your real eyeing because your personality is your idea of yourself. It's your image of yourself. And that's made up of how you feel yourself, how you think about yourself, thrown in with what all your friends and relations have told you about yourself. So your image of yourself, however, obviously isn't you any more than your photograph is you or any more than uh, the image of anything is it. All our images of ourselves are nothing more than caricatures. They contain no information, for most of us, on how we grow our brains, how we work our nerves, how we circulate our blood, how we secrete with our glands, and how we shape our bones. That isn't contained in the sensation or the image we call the ego. So obviously then, the ego image is not myself. So myself contains all these factors that we could say the body is doing, the circulation of the blood, the breathing, the electrical activity of the nerves, all this is me, but I don't know anything about it. I don't know how it came together. I don't know how it's constructed. And yet I do all that. If it is true also to say, I breathe, I walk, I think, I am conscious. I don't know how I manage to be, but I do it in the same way as I grow my hair. So I must therefore locate the center of me, my eyeing, at a deeper level than my ego, which is my image or idea of myself. But how deep do we go? We can say the body is the I. But the body comes out of the rest of the universe, comes out of all its energy. So it's the universe that's eyeing. And the universe eyes in the same way that a tree apples or that a star shines. And the center of the appling is the tree, the center of the shining is the star, and so the basic center, or self, of the eyeing, which is called in this case Alan Watts, which is only a name for this particular physical organism, flowering from, shining out of this particular environment, makes the center of all this eyeing the eternal universe, or eternal. The thing has existed for 10,000 million years. 
and will probably go on for at least that much more. So we won't worry about how long it goes on. But repeatedly it eyes. So that it seems to me absolutely reasonable to assume that when I die and this physical body evaporates and the whole memory system with it, then it will be all over once again the awareness that I had before, not exactly the same way, but of a baby being born. There will, of course, be myriads of babies born, not only baby human beings, but baby frogs, baby rabbits, baby fruit flies, baby viruses, baby bacteria. And which one of them am I going to be? Only one of them, and yet every one of them, because this experience comes always in the singular, one at a time. But certainly one of them actually doesn't make much difference because if I were born again as a fruit fly I would think that being a fruit fly was the normal ordinary course of events and naturally I would think that I was an important person a highly cultured being because fruit flies obviously have a high culture we don't even know how to look for it but probably they have all sorts of symphonies and music and artistic performances in the way light is reflected on their wings in different ways, the way they dance in the air. And they say, oh, look at her, she has real style. Look how the sunlight comes off her wings. And they, in their world, think they're as important and as civilized as we do in our world. So that if I were to wake up as a fruit fly, I wouldn't feel any different, as it were, than I do when I wake up as a human being. I would be used to it. Well, you say, though, it wouldn't be me. Because if it would be me again, I would have to remember how I was before. All right, but you don't now remember how you were before. And yet, you're content enough to be the me that you are. In fact, it's a thoroughly good arrangement in this world that we don't remember what it was before. Why? Because... Variety is the spice of life. And if we remembered, 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 having done this again and again and again and again, we should get bored. And uh, just as a memory is a beautiful thing to have, to remember, without memory we can't be intelligent. But just as I have explained that in order to see the figure you have to have the background, in order that a memory be valuable, you've also got to have a forgettery. That's why we sleep every night to refresh ourselves. We go into the unconscious so that coming back to the conscious is again a great experience. Well, when that's gone on long enough, when day after day we remember the days that, that have gone before, even though there's the interval of sleep, there comes a point when really, if we consider what is to our true liking, we will want to forget everything that went before so that we can have the extraordinary experience of seeing the world once again through the eyes of a baby, whatever kind of baby, so that it's completely new. We have all the startling wonder that a child has, all the vividness of perception, which we can't have if we remember everything forever. So do you see what happens? The universe is a system which not only forgets itself and then again remembers anew so that there's always this constant change and constant variety in the span of time but it also does it in the span of space by looking at itself through every different living organism to give as it were an all-round view you know, that's a way of getting rid of prejudice, getting rid of a one-sided view. So, death, in that sense, is a tremendous release from monotony. It puts an interval of total forgetting 
in a rhythmic process of on and off, on and off, so that you can begin all over again and never be bored. But the point is that if you fantasize the idea of being nothing for always and always and always, what you're really saying is, after I'm dead, the universe stops. And what I'm saying is, no, it goes on just as it did when you were born. You see, you may say that you think it incredible that you have more than one life. But I say, first of all, is it isn't it incredible that you have this one? Isn't it incredible that out of the nothing that is your past, here you are? Well, it's astonishing. So, if that's astonishing, it can always happen again and again and again. No. What this is saying then is that just as you don't know how you manage to be conscious, how you manage to grow and shape this body of yours, that doesn't mean to say that you're not doing it. Equally, you don't know how the universe shines the stars, constellates the constellation, and galactifies the galaxies. You don't know. But that doesn't mean to say that you aren't doing it in just the same way as you're breathing without knowing how you breathe. If I say really and truly, I am this whole universe, or put it in another way, uh, this particular organism is an eyeing being done by the whole universe. And somebody could say to me, well, who the hell do you think you are? Are you God? Do you warm up the galaxies? Canst thou bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loosen the bonds of Orion? And I reply to that, who the hell do you think you are? Can you tell me how you grow your brain, how you shape your eyeballs, and how you manage to see? Well, if you can't tell me that, I can't tell you how I warm up the galaxy. Only I've located the center of myself at a deeper, and a more universal level than we are in our culture accustomed to do. So then, if that universal energy is the real me, the real self which eyes as all these different organisms spread out in different spaces or places, and happening again and again and again at different times. We've got a marvelous system going in which you can be eternally surprised. The universe is really a system which keeps on surprising itself. The ambition that many of us have, especially in, a, in an age of technological competence, to have everything under our control is a false ambition because you've only got to think for one moment what would it be like if you did really know and control everything. Supposing we had a super colossal technology which could go to our wildest dreams of technological competence so that everything that is going to happen would be foreknown, predicted, and everything would be under our control. Why, you know, it'd be like making love to a plastic woman. There would be no surprise in it. No sudden answering touch, as when we touch another human being, it's not like touching something made of plastic. There comes out a response, something unexpected. And that's what we really want. When we want to relate to the other. You see, you can't experience the feeling you call self unless it's in contrast with the feeling of other. It's like known and unknown, light and dark, positive and negative. Other is necessary in order for you to feel 
self. So then, isn't that the arrangement you want? And so in the same way, couldn't you say, the arrangement you want is not to remember. Memory is always remember a form of control. I've got it in mind, I remember it, I know your number. You're under control. Now if you go on remembering and remembering and remembering, it's like writing on a piece of paper and going on writing and writing and writing until there's no white space left on the paper. Your memory is filled up. And so you need to wipe it all clean so that you have a white paper all over again and can begin to write on it once more. So that's what death does for us. It wipes the slate clean and also, for looking at it from the point of view of population and the human organism on the planet, it keeps cleaning us out. And the idea of a technology which would enable each one of us to be immortal would be something that would progressively crowd the planet with people with hopelessly crowded memories. They would, as it were, be like people living in a house where they'd accumulated so much property, so many books, so many vases, so many sets of knives and forks, so many tables and chairs, so many newspapers, that there wouldn't be any room to move around. To live, we need space. And space is a kind of nothingness. And death is a kind of nothingness. It's all the same principle. And by putting blocks, as it were, or spaces of nothingness, spaces of space, in between spaces of something, we get life properly spaced out, to use the German word Lebensraum, room for living. That's what space gives us, and that's what death gives us. Now look, notice that in everything I've said about death, I haven't brought in anything that I could call spookery. I haven't brought in any information about anything that you don't already know. I haven't invoked any mysterious knowledge about souls, memory of former lives, anything like that. I've just talked about it in terms that we already know, so that if you say, well, all this idea that people have of life beyond the grave is just wishful thinking, I say, okay, I'll grant that. Let's assume that that is wishful thinking and that when we are dead, there just won't be anything. See? Let's face that fact. That'll be the end. Now, notice first of all, that's the worst thing you've got to fear. Does it frighten you? Who's going to be afraid? Supposing it ends, no more problems. But then, you will see that this nothingness, if you followed my argument, is something, as it were, you bounce off from again, just as you bounced in the first place when you were born. You bounced out of nothingness. Nothingness is a kind of bounce. Because it implies, the nothing implies something. So you bounce back. All new, all different. Nothing to compare it with before. A refreshing experience. And if, therefore, you get this sense, just like you've got the sense of nothing behind your eyes, get the sense of nothingness, very powerful, frisky nothingness, underlying your whole being. And there's nothing in that nothing to be afraid of. Then, with that sense, you can come on like a person for whom the rest of life is gravy because you're already dead. You know you're going to die. We say there's one thing certain, which is death and taxes. And the death of each one of us now is as certain as it would be if we were going to die five minutes from now. 
So where's your anxiety? Where's your hang-up? Regard yourself as dead already so that you have nothing to lose. Turkish proverb says, he who sleeps on the floor will not fall out of bed. So in the same way, the person who regards himself as already dead, who therefore you are virtually nothing. A hundred years from now, you'll be a handful of dust. That'll be for real. All right, act on that reality. And out of that, nothing. You will suddenly surprise yourself that the more you know you're nothing, the more you'll amount to something.